Thank you very much to Hudson. That was a very informative talk. <laughs> Up next, we have Sean Wilkinson. He's the CEO, CTO at Storage, which is a distributed platform for data storage. Sean fights for the users and their data. <laughs> He's a lover of Bitcoin and Ethereum. And Sean holds a BS in um, computer science from Morehouse. Please join me in welcoming Sean. Hello, can you hear me all right? Cool. I like to walk around a little bit, uh, interact with the audience a little bit more. Uh, so I'm going to go from behind the podium. Uh, as I said, my name is Sean Wilkinson. Um, we're working on a distributed platform and decentralized platform for cloud storage using uh, blockchain tech. Um, so a quick question to the audience. How many of you are building out next gen financial systems? Just raise your hand. Okay, a couple of people. How many people use cloud storage? OK, everybody, just about. So this is, this is a pretty useful and relevant application of the technology that impacts a lot of people. So the, the premise for storage is quite simple, is that you have your traditional cloud storage uh, companies like Amazon, Google Cloud, that go spend $600 million on a data center to store data. But at the end of the day, you got you know, that laptop right there and that laptop right there that has some extra hard drive space space and bandwidth that's not really being used. And what if we could harness that into a network uh, to, to store a lot of data? Uh, and so it, it, it kind of came um, from me being an undergraduate um, you know, back in 2014, wanted to store a lot of data using these traditional cloud storage providers. And they're too expensive and, and didn't really have the feature sets that I wanted. So I just thought, well, we have this resource laying around. You know, what if we could utilize that? And kind of embarked on that journey and found that, you know, wait a minute, using this distributed network can actually solve a lot of the problems in cloud storage. Because at the end of the day, you know, the internet is a decentralized and distributed network. And we're just storing all these data, uh, this data in these centralized providers and places. And so that's where a lot of the pain points happen. Um, so we believe that anyone can be a part of the cloud rather than uh, just large companies. So let's talk a little bit about the problems with cloud storage. Number one, OK, so who uses or has used Dropbox, LinkedIn, or Yahoo? Just raise your hand. All those providers have been hacked. I can buy your credentials online for five bucks on, uh, on the dark web. right? So that, that's not that great. <laughs> and it's getting worse and worse and worse every year um, as this model kind of breaks down. Number two. Um, the centralized providers sometimes have issues. Uh, actually, what, like two months ago, Amazon S3 went down uh, and took a quarter of the internet with it. You know, a lot of people are dependent on these services, and so when you're running a really big business, that's, that's not good. That's, that's a lot of money lost. Um, number three, performance. Uh, you're bottlenecked by your connection to your local data center, uh, so if there's issues there, there's slowdown. And number four is cost. People are using more and more and more data, and the cost isn't really dropping that much. In fact, it's pretty much stopped. Um, they've just stopped figuring out ways to scale down that cost. So under storage, which is this magical decentralized and distributed network, and our aim is to solve these, these problems. So number one, um, the data is encrypted client side before it even goes out onto our network, and only the user has the keys. And so it's a decentralized and zero-knowledge network where only the user has control and access of that data, not us. We get hacked, doesn't matter. We don't have the encryption keys. Traditional provider, oh no. Um, this would probably be useful for some former presidential candidates to store their data, just maybe. Uh, number two, downtime, since we're a decentralized and distributed system, and we don't have central points of failure, uh, we're working on building into a service uh, a way that our service can completely fail. But since all the data is on a uh, decentralized and distributed network, you can still access and use it. That's super powerful um, to a lot of use cases. Number three, uh, performance is peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, who here has used BitTorrent? Raise your hand. Decent bunch of you. So you know how that looks like at its scale and the performance that you get um, out of that. Uh, because you can use multiple simultaneous connections instead of one. And since we don't have to build out these $600 million data centers, it's a lot cheaper. A little bit of overview of the technology. Let's say you want to upload some cat pictures to our network. Um, you encrypt that data with only keys that you know and have access to, not us. 
then that data is broken down into small pieces. And then it is spread redundantly on this distributed network. And then those pieces are audited uh, to make sure they're, they're online. So um, what's your name? You here? Cool. OK. And your name? Dheeraj. OK. So let's say Dheeraj is, is storing um, some data, and he turns his computer offline. Uh, Eduardo uh, can say, you know, I have some extra hard drive space. And we can take, what's your name? Aaron. Aaron also has a copy. So he goes down. We can transfer a copy from Aaron to Eduardo, covering the redundancy and making sure the data is available. Uh, if you want like intense technical details, we have a white paper. Uh, it's the storage.io slash storage.pdf. But that's, that's a high level overview. Uh, so our, our core customers and our core focus is developers. Right? Because when you're downloading the next cat picture sharing app, you don't care if it goes to Amazon S3 or Google Cloud, and just, you just want it to work. And so developers are the ones that are actually making the choices for us as users for cloud storage. And so we're all about providing tools and interfaces and APIs to enable them to do that um, and do that easily. And so they can pass on these cool features to the user. Uh, we have a small enterprise focus. We have 20,000 API users and one enterprise customer. So I think that kind of gives you an idea of, of where our focus is. Um, and we're also focused on you know, building out large partnerships and channel partners. For example, Heroku, which is a million plus developer platform. We can do you know, an integration and touch many developers rather than try to convert each individual user. So we have two products uh, in the space. One is called Storage Share, which you can download right now on your computer and earn money from your extra free hard drive space and bandwidth. Uh, it's pretty simple. You enter in three fields, hit go, uh, and it takes care of everything in the background for you. It's not hard to convince people to uh, earn money for their extra hard drive space that they have laying, laying around. So people really love that and really love that we've made it easy. Number two is our uh, products uh, for developers, storage.io. It's an interface where they can go learn about the platform, download the tools, manage uh, their billing, and all these other components. Um, it's really designed to just abstract the technology as much as possible so people just focus on pushing data in uh, and getting data out. Um, so our, our competition is the more traditional players, the big three, the Amazon S3, the Google Cloud, uh, the Microsoft Azure. We're competing up with these platforms head up on storage because we can say, hey, we can do the exact same thing that you do, but we can do it faster, we can do a, a lot more securely, and we can do it cheaper. And so that's really compelling um, to a lot of use cases. Um, so I, I've heard in the audience there's, there's a couple from people from uh, oil and gas, and so maybe I'll go into an example uh, 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 about how this might be useful. Um, from what I understand, uh, you know, they have to do a lot of surveys. Um, uh, for geological data to find you know, little pockets of, of oil and gas. And this can amount to you know, hundreds of or thousands uh, of terabytes of information. And they're running these rigs that you know, cost a million dollars a day. And the information's taken like a couple of weeks you know, to, to transfer around uh, to different uh, processes and, and, and being analyzed and processed. So that's. That's, that's a pretty huge efficiency. Um, and, and that's something that you get out of the traditional uh, cloud storage and traditional platforms. Versus we can take that data and we can store it a lot cheaper if you want it later on, or transfer that data you know, uh, 10 times faster uh, than you could out of a traditional system. And so that's just one use case. Storage is very general. There's many use cases that you can use it for. This is one, ca one use case where it can be really impactful compared to more traditional players. So like I said, it's not hard to convince people to earn money for just something they have laying around. So we've, we've had a huge amount of growth uh, in terms of people renting out their hard drive space in the network. And we continue to make it easier and easier. Um, and likewise, on the developer side, we're really focusing on making our tools uh, and platform and easy to use uh, for developers to build out their application. Uh, so making you know, the, the applications and the interfaces uh, have a really good experience. Because the, the, the more traditional platforms like, haven't been really innovated in like 10 years. Like, I think Amazon S3 still has like, its old SOAP endpoints that like, no one uses. So we're really trying to, again, make the platform easy 
uh, for us uh, users to use to really take advantage of these features. A little bit of our timeline, uh, we just finished a $3 million uh, seed round. Um, we launched uh, our product uh, commercially uh, last month on the 15th. Uh, it's been in development for about three years. Um, it's all open source, all free software, uh, and we've just iterated over time until we said, this is ready to go. Uh, and interesting enough, uh, we are going through a migration um, from Counterparty, uh, which is built on the Bitcoin blockchain, but we had some issues with that in terms of usability and transaction times and really not providing a great user experience from our users. So, the um, next couple of months, we're actually transferring over our entire technology stack to um, Ethereum, um, which provides it has a lot more vibrant ecosystem. For example, we had um, a wallet software that our users use to manage their uh, cryptocurrency, their tokens, storage coin tokens that we use in this network to buy and sell space and for a bunch of other services. Um, and they're using this wallet that's like two years old, hasn't really been, you know, or hasn't been updated in two years, sorry. Um, you know, very you know, difficult interface to use and we're, we said enough of that. Uh, let's, let's move to a more vibrant uh, ecosystem. Second part of that is Ethereum allows us to use some really advanced features in terms of smart contracts uh, and whatnot to really build out a, a, a secondary, really robust layer for a platform and natively integrate with all these really cool and exciting uh, Ethereum applications that are popping up. Um, so uh, that's a pretty interesting thing that I can talk about. Also, uh, as a portion of this migration, we're going to be doing uh, a token sale, um, which we are going to raise anywhere from 15 to $20 million. Um, so. If you want to know more about that, just ask me in questions. Um, it's definitely a very different model in terms of funding these protocols and these projects uh, from the traditional kind of venture capital area that, that, that people have years, uh, used in yesteryear. So um, that's it. A uh, little uh, tidbit about the team. But uh, I think I have a, a few minutes left for uh, questions. And then uh, come see me afterwards in the uh, breakout session. I have. Uh, business cards and stickers, if you want them. So. So I just wanted to ask you, um, as I understand, there's a storage token that exists today. There is already uh, a, a token crowdfund done, and then a Series A traditional round, and now a subsequent token crowdfund. So how do all of those? funding mechanisms kind of work together. So what happens with the original token? Is the subsequent token um, then going to inflate the original token? Or, or is it a different token and then you do away with the, the other token and it's a mini-me concept? Or, and and how, does, uh, how do the VC investors uh, factor into this? Yeah, so the, the, the uh, difference between like uh, you know these new crowdfunding mechanisms and equity it just got people's heads spinning like everyone's trying to understand the, these models um, so in 2014 we did a crowdfund um, we raised a half million dollars uh, you know back th this technology was really you know new and out there in 2014 if you ask you know average person what you know Bitcoin is or the technology that that's used for like drugs and guns right <laughs> uh, so you know very difficult to convince like a venture cap well, no, well you were around those times or thereabouts so I think you know a little bit more what I'm talking about than some of the newer people in, the, in this audience uh, <laughs> So, uh, you know, that was, that allowed us to kind of get our start, uh, build the technology, and we kind of came to 2015 and went, you know, this technology is really cool and really useful, but like, we need to make it easier for, for people to, to, to use. Um, you know, so we built a company in 2015 to kind of abstract um, that, that te technology and, and really make it a powerful and easy to use tool uh, for developers. Um, come here now to 2017, we're focusing on, on kind of doubling down uh, on, on that platform uh, and building out, since we, we pretty much accomplished the goals that we set out to do in 2014, build a decentralized storage network, did that. Uh, you know, our, our real fo uh, focus and push is 
like, you know, scaling out the tools that we need to be able to compete with Amazon S3 and Google Cloud and all these large platforms, which like make billions of dollars. So, you know, even, you know, with 15, 20 million dollars, that's chump change compared to these large organizations. Um, so building out those tools, but also utilizing all these next gen technologies that uh, exist on Ethereum that we just didn't have um, before. So um, this token sale really allows us to do that and is really a new mechanism that allows us to propel that at an insanely accelerated pace that you just can't do with any traditional model. So more questions. Very interesting, um, and congratulations on meeting your milestones. Uh, one question, so in this uh, distributed network, uh, can you restrict the cross-border sharing of the data so the nodes can be within a, a country boundary? Yeah, so this is actually a really interesting use case that is that is emerging now, is that you have these countries that are saying, we're going to pass these you know, data geolocation laws where your data you know, inside of Russia can't leave our borders. It needs to be, you know, constrained within our borders. And so, like, the, the people who are, are building these traditional services are, like, strangling to keep up. Like, you, you, the, the amount of data that, you know, people need to store uh, is just growing exponentially, and they're just scrambling to build, you know, data centers and traditional infrastructure to keep up. So that's a really interesting market that, that we're starting to look at and focus on as it, as it grows, is where we can say, hey, we know this uh, node's here uh, in Russia uh, and a couple other nodes. You know, let's keep that data there. Let's restrict it there because that's the use case that the customer wants. Um, and people can even get a premium uh, on, on storing data there because, again, that's something that's highly in demand and the traditional market is not keeping up with, with that demand. So that's a very interesting model that, that is new. So um, his question was, uh, uh, is that something we can support now? So um, that's something that we have the raw data for. Um, to, to actually determine that, but we don't have essentially a logic system to do that. So it is something that we're looking out to build probably in the next few months um, as there is customer interest for it. Yeah. Questions? How much time do I have? I don't want to... Five minutes? Cool. Hey, Sean, thanks. My uh, question is, is, is really one of uh, being able to use that stored data for big data and, and mining and research and that kind of thing. How would that work? So our, our traditional focus right now is in more static content, right? So um, having you know, pictures, images, video, raw data that you want to store for long periods of time or you want to quickly move it from point A to point B. So that, that is our focus. Um, so when you want to take this data and, and you know, do large amounts of computation or processing or analytics, that's something that you want to probably still use the you know, traditional providers like Amazon S3 for. Um, and there's definitely a lot of projects working on those kinds of solutions, but they're not here yet. Um, so again, our, our core focus is more on static data. Um, right now, uh, and being able to transmit that and store that way better than the traditional providers. Um, but for processing, I'd leave that to the technology that we know and have already right now. More questions? Another one over here. Hey, so you uh, you talked about storage costs. Uh, you're obviously going to have a lot more I/O in this model than you would with a traditional provider. So I'm just curious as to how the uh, I/O costs stack up. Yeah, so um, for our model is we're charging half off any traditional provider, and we'll probably go down from there. But at the end of the day, the costs are a lot different, right? While it might be a little bit less efficient on I.O., at the end of the day, we're not building out a $600 million data center to be able to do this. We just have, you know, your laptop over there that's, you know, just maybe doing some word processing or some Twitter, and 99% uh, you know, of its, its, its resources are not really being used uh, to their full utilization. Um, so that ends up being essentially sunk costs instead of real you know, CapEx and OpEx costs. So we can eat that efficiency easily, right? It's just because that, uh, the costs are so cheap because they're already paid for. Um, so different economics. Economics, between, yeah, it's, it's built in. It's economics between you know, Airbnb and Hyatt. Right? Airbnb doesn't have to go build a hotel. It just needs to convince someone that they can rent out you know, their, their extra apartment. 
Um, so, does that answer your question? Okay. You and then. Um, we saw the trials and tribulations of using counterparty in Bitcoin, like transaction fees or the non-standardness of multisig. Uh, do you foresee anything going into ERC-20 that could be a potential risk in the future? Um, no, uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> we don't know what the future holds. So, you know, our, our thought is, is to keep um, the technology uh, and the platforms that we use as modular, as flexible as possible. Um, so that if we need to move things around or move to, there's now talk of ERC-23, which has like all these new cool and exciting things. Um, we just need to keep the technology uh, as open and interoperable as, as other people were talking about in other presentations. Um, so that's our thought. And then you. Yeah. What, what kind of challenges have you had with IO speed and what have you done to address them? Uh, so around IO speed, um, one of the things that we've, we've most been mostly looking into recently um, is uh, Reed Solomon erasure encoding. Um, so basically, that's just something that allows us to say, hey, this piece of data is missing. Um, we have all the other pieces of data. We can reconstruct um, that, that, that missing piece. Um, and so we've been looking at um, a lot of different ways to do that. Uh, and it just ends up there's, there's some benefits that you get from that, and there's some trade-offs um, for that. Um, so for that, it, there, there's multiple different ways that we can go where you can save I.O. and other ways uh, that, that you don't save that I.O., but you get so many other features. Um, so what we've been doing is just building out general tools and then going down in the specific use, use case of what you're doing, whether you know, a little fix a, a bit of extra I.O. doesn't really matter, or like that's super important to get the data around or, or move it around, then you know, we, we choose another method. So again, we're just trying to build out general tools, and then we go down into the specific you know, use case that you're trying to build where we can adjust some of those parameters so you, you get that benefit or you don't. Yeah. All right. Do I have, can I take one more? You had any trouble finding commercial liability insurance to mitigate your risk? Uh, for that, I think we're actually signing up for that right now. <laughs> um, so that only really comes to play with enterprise customers, mostly. Um, so yeah, anyone can sue us, yes. Um, but the, the stakes are a lot higher when it comes to, to enterprise customers. So uh, our model is compared to a lot of other decentralized and blockchain technologies. A little, people get it a little bit more. It's, it's a little bit more traditional in terms of the top level structure. We're just offering a data service. And, and people know how to, to um, build insurance models around that. Um, so there is a few new parts that you know, there's, there's a lot of you know, questions at the last about that. But uh, it, it's, it's a model that's a little bit closer to the, the traditional model, because we're just offering a data service. So. Um, I don't know if that answers your question to satisfaction, but uh, all right, you're kind of me. All right, come see me uh, in the breakout room afterwards. Thanks for listening. Okay, so following the model that we had the last time, uh, both Sean and Hudson will be available in rooms 214 and 216, which are just outside these doors, up the stairs, and then down the hallway where Hudson mentioned the uh, high school lockers. Um, I suggest you go because the, the more intimate setting, is, you can ask a lot of great questions of the speakers that maybe you wouldn't ask in, in an auditorium setting. And meet back here. Uh, for a continuation at 4.05.